Head of Alliance Manchester Business School here at the University of Manchester. So thank you, first of all, to everybody for joining us this afternoon. It was always a great pleasure to see so many people supporting our Vital Topics lecture series here at the Business School at the University. So today we are thrilled to welcome back, and it's very nice to say welcome back, uh, to the school, Andy Haldane, Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Arts, former Chief Economist at the Bank of England, and an honorary professor here at the Business School and the University of Manchester. Our vital topic series provides us with an opportunity to hear from leading experts from around the worlds of business management and policy with fascinating ideas and original thinking at the forefront of their talks. So we've had a range of speakers of the course of this academic year talking about a myriad of intriguing topics and Andy's talk today will certainly be no exception. Let me take this opportunity to thank DWF for their continued support in sponsoring these vital topic events. Now, today's lecture will center around one of the key economic challenges. Uh, my talk says of the decade, but maybe I have to say the century, and is entitled Leveling Up, What, Why, How? This is a topic that is especially timely given the economic trials that the country face at the moment. You all need to look at the newspaper to see that, of course. And it is also a topic of particular interest to us here in the north of the country where the benefits of leveling up will be so keenly felt. The official white paper entitled Leveling Up in the United Kingdom was published in February of this year and is a roadmap aimed at spreading opportunity across the UK more equally. Andy was appointed by the Prime Minister to define and then progress a long-term strategic vision. And today's event is a fantastic opportunity for us all to gain some insights in what this will mean for the years ahead. Andy, as many of you will know, worked for th over 30 years at the Bank of England, uh, and with three decades of experience, he is an expert in the field of financial stability. More recently, he served on both the Financial Policy Committee and Monetary Policy Committee. And in addition, Andy was head of the Leveling Up Task Force in the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities from September of 2021 through to March of this year. He also led the government's Industrial Strategy Council and in 2009 co-founded Pro Bono Economics, a charity dedicated to using economics to empower the social sector. And he was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine in 2014. And among other positions is a fellow of the Royal Society and of the Academy of Social Sciences and governor of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. So as I said at the start, it's lovely to see so many colleagues here today in person. Very pleased to see you face to face. And we're also delighted to be welcoming an online audience from around the globe. So thank you also to all of you for coming along for today's events, wherever you are joining us. Now, there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of today's sessions for your questions. Those in the room should put up their hands in the old fashioned way, while those online could perhaps type their questions into the chat function um, at the bottom of the screen. We will alternate between both sets of questions so that there is full participation by both the face-to-face -face and online audience. So uh, as I say, we, we will take questions from both audiences. I'm also delighted to be joined by Professor Luke Giorgio today, who's going, kindly taken the time to facilitate the discussion that we will be having later. Luke is Deputy President and Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the University of Manchester and Professor of Science and Technology Policy and Management in the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research within AMBS, so known, of course, to many of us very well. So I'm, I'm sure you're all very keen to get started. So let's hand over to Andy to begin this presentation. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Fiona, for that 
extremely kind introduction. Um, and afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to be back uh, here. Um, now I'm officially part of the family as well. The business is fantastic part of the, the family. Uh, I'm back, as Diana mentioned, with a different guys. Last time I was here, I was at the Bank of England. Uh, now I'm at the Royal Society of Art. So you'll spot the difference because I'm now wearing brown shoes rather than a black one. Um, and uh, Manchester, in some ways, uh, Greater Manchester is the uh, the poster child, the exemplar, the oh, there you go, <laughs> the mic kicking in, I think, mm -hmm. um, the trailblazer for leveling up. So, where better to talk about leveling up, I think, than here? Uh, indeed, the university here at Manchester, in some ways, is also an exemplar of the key role uh, played by civic anchor institutions, which, as I'll go on to discuss a bit, are absolutely fundamental, I think, to making a success uh, of the not just here in Greater Manchester, but right across, uh, right across the UK. So um, great to be here. Now as part of the family, uh, and where better than, than Greater Manchester and the university. Um, Fiona mentioned uh, that I had a hand, maybe a couple of feet, uh, in the levelling of white paper that was issued by the government uh, earlier this year. Um, I understand everyone has, has read all 375 pages, uh, which is good to hear, because I'll be testing you during the course of today's presentation on, on different author chapters and indeed the footnotes. Um, you know the staff's in the room, it's excellent. Um, and the rough format will be, uh, I'll talk about um, three things, um, which is the why, which is easy, why level up? Uh, the what, uh, what we actually mean by leveling up, that's a bit harder. Uh, and then finally, um, the how, which is the hardest of all, which is what's uh, you know, am I echoing a bit, by the way? No, yeah. So, so um, it. We're okay now. Is that yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what that. And there will be plenty of time at the end for. Um, no, it's still echoing. Is that any better? There you go, just move the mic. Um, uh, great, and then plenty of time, Luke's gonna uh, offer some comments and plenty of time for you to ask me some questions. There are huge numbers uh, of open questions. There aren't necessarily large numbers of open questions. And that's because the heavy lifting of leveling up will be done very much more, as much uh, by you as it will by central government. In some ways, that is the key uh, takeaway uh, of today's presentation. So let me start on the why, then, in some ways, the easiest bit. Why are we bothering uh, to do this? Well, in some ways, the facts here speak for themselves. Let me set out the facts. I imagine many of them will be familiar to many of you. Here's a spatial map uh, of the UK. We've changed devices. Yeah, really sorry. Wow, in real time. Um, thank you. On this side. Can I hold up? Is that better? That's better. Right. In the pocket. That's definitely less pleasing, but I'm sure. That better. Can we hear that again? That's better. Have some knobs. I need to abandon the mic after I've been used to all Speak up. Spatial map the UK, it's pay. This looks at weekly pay across different parts uh, of the UK. It's a detailed map. The key takeaway is that the gap between the really well paid areas, shown here in the lighter shaded bits, uh, and the poorly paid areas and the darker shaded bits, they're really big. Different by a factor of around two. Huge differences in.
and financials. Uh, it equally shows health. Uh, this looks at uh, measures of healthy life expectancy uh, across different parts of the UK, different sort of map. Here, the very healthiest areas are in light, uh, the less healthy areas are in dark. The gap between the two in terms of healthy life expectancies is huge. It is around a decade. And indeed, some of those differences are larger still if I looked at a higher level of granularity uh, than that. So whether it's wealth or health, the spatial differences across UK PLC uh, are really big. Big uh, also uh, historically. So this looks at a, a different measure, a measure of uh, income, GDP, GVA per head across different UK regions, across a long span of history, right back to 1900 for different parts uh, of the UK. The key takeaway here is these spatial differences are large, these regional differences are large, and they are long lived. The broad ranking of regions by GVA per head in 2020 is not much different than it was in uh, 1900. Uh, the Northwest, which is the dotted blue line, middle of the pack back then, still middle of the pack today, 120 uh, years later. The rough pattern is of those regional differences having narrowed a bit in the first part of the period up until the Second World War and having progressively widened over the period uh, since then, over the last 70 years or so. Quite a long period for spatial differences uh, to be widening. What's true historically is equally true internationally. So this looks at a measure of regional disparity across OECD countries. The UK here is fourth uh, from the left. Uh, only Hungary, Colombia, and Turkey have spatial differences larger uh, than in the UK. The UK stands out relative to pretty much every uh, other uh, Western advanced uh, economy. So we, are, we are distinguish ourselves historically, current spatial differences uh, are larger, as large as they have been since late Victorian times, and we distinguish ourselves, distinguish ourselves uh, internationally uh, as well, uh, in both cases, for the wrong reasons. Uh, those gaps uh, are larger. Now, um, not all metrics of success tell exactly the same story. This looks at the correlation between uh, different measures of regional or spatial disparity in the UK. Uh, and green here uh, signals a positive correlation between them, uh, and red signals uh, a negative correlation. So you know, productivity, uh, regional differences in productivity correlate very strongly with regional differences in the second item, which is disposable income, right? And indeed, many of the financials, uh, such as yeah, education and employment and the like. If you look at the bottom of the list there, you'll see for some, these measures of success have a negative correlation. So what that means uh, is that the spatial pattern, the spatial differences, for things like income or productivity are rather different when you think about metrics such as uh, well being or life satisfaction or measures of conjecture, uh, congestion, such as rooms per person or social capital, such as people's perceptions uh, of their network. And in fact, if we look at a map not of uh, wealth uh, or of health, but of happiness which is this picture here, a measure, a spatial measure, a regional measure of life satisfaction. What we see in some respects is the exact mirror image of what we see for health and for wealth. 
So at the very, London, for example, London is at the very top of the UK league table for measures of income or productivity, but comes at the very bottom of the league table when it comes to well-being. So I am as miserable as sin, basically. Um, uh, and the reasons for that, I think, relatively well known, which is overpriced and overcongested housing, overpriced and overcongested transport, weak social networks of various types, high levels of pollution, small areas of green space, and the like. So quite a variegated map. And I'll come back to this when telling a story about the importance of leveling up both for rich regions and for poor uh, regions. Another important element when understanding this rich, this rich economic and social geography across the UK is shown by this picture. Uh, this looks at differences within region as well as between region on a success metric uh, GDP uh, per job. And the key takeaway here is that the differences looking horizontally uh, between region are actually smaller than the differences looking vertically within region. So within region differences are larger on average than between region differences. So you make a great mistake if you think you can understand the UK's rich economic geography purely by looking at regional patterns, as much or more of the action lies at the sub-regional level, at the local level, indeed, at the hyper-local level. Because if you look, if you drill down, if you go to a higher level of resolution in these diagrams, what you see is pockets of affluence and deprivation sitting next to each other, cheek by jowl. I was crossing Salford earlier on this morning. You see it in Salford. Here's a, another example, uh, one from the south, one from the north, uh, one from Kensington and Chelsea, which you think is being a relatively rich area, but actually sits right next to one of the most acute areas of urban deprivation in the country. Same is true of Middlesbrough. Truth be told, you can go to any city pretty much in the UK and find not just rich and poor, but often them sitting right next to one another. And the key point here is that leveling up economic and social geographies can't be defined by North versus South. It can't even by, be defined by cities versus towns versus villages. The story is much richer, much more granular than that. Leveling up is a hyper-local pursuit if we are to make a success of it. And this final point um, underscores that point to an extent. What this picture does is it plots uh, each dot as a city, the blue dots are UK cities. Uh, the red dots are a set of international cities. And it plots the relative population sizes of those cities horizontally against a measure of success, GVA per worker uh, in those cities. Now, generally speaking, you would expect a positive correlation between those, those two things. Generally speaking, we think of there being economies of scale and of scope when it comes to cities, what's sometimes called agglomeration effects. Large areas generate additional benefits, additional efficiencies. And for international cities, the red, and the, the red dotted line is a line of best fit through those international cities, that is true. Bigger is better. It shows up in higher GVA, GDP uh, per head. For UK cities, that's the blue dots on the dotted blue line, it's much less obviously 
the case that bigger is indeed uh, better. For the vast majority of UK cities, including ones like Greater Manchester, that will be perceived as, being, as doing very well, they sit well below the red line of best fit. And indeed, in the case of Manchester and Birmingham, you can see there, sit below even the blue line of best fit for the UK cities. This is a pretty well-known phenomenon. And it is that London notwithstanding, the UK has a disproportionate number of underperforming in international terms, if not absolutely, uh, second cities, which includes the place where we all sit today in Manchester, but not, of, not just Manchester, it includes Birmingham, Sheffield, Newcastle, Leeds, Belfast, Bristol, Edinburgh, Glasgow. Lots of places they were doing very well, absolutely, but in relative terms are still punching below their weight. They could be doing better for their size than they are currently. There is unlocked potential within those second cities. And there endeth the diagnosis. Uh, it's a relatively familiar one of wide and widening disparities regionally and sub-regionally that operate hyper-locally that have a very variegated pattern across different success metrics and which show up uh, in slightly uh, underperforming second cities of various types. So given that, let's now turn to leveling up and what it is, and just as importantly, what it isn't. Well, um, there was some risk for some time when the term was first used back in uh, July 2019. This was, I think, the first time that the Prime Minister spoke in terms of leveling up in Parliament. I'll let you read that for yourself. That was setting out of the words uh, of the concept. In actual fact, uh, the Prime Minister wasn't, I don't think, the first person to use the expression uh, leveling up. Um, the expression can be traced back at least 250 years earlier to a different Johnson, actually, which is this one. Samuel Johnson, um, the uh, author and lexicographer. So for those of you um, who are struggling to remember who he was, um, in the Blackadder episode about the dictionary, he was the Robbie Coltrane, Coltrane figure, right? So uh, if that's your historical frame of reference, just think of this as Robbie Coltrane. Um, and here he is, 1763, in one of his diaries, uh, talking about leveling up, and he was talking about leveling up and actually being quite skeptical about leveling up and that he thought the rich areas wouldn't let it happen. Um, and I'm gonna argue uh, that at least on this one, uh, Samuel uh, uh, Johnson S is wrong uh, and Johnson B is right, uh, which is I think um, there was something in leveling up both for the rich as well as for the poorer parts. I'll go on and say a bit more about that uh, in a second. Anyway, key takeaway, if any of your friends ever ask you uh, who invented leveling up, just tell them it was manufactured by Johnson & Johnson. That will really confuse them. Um, so um, how do we get from that high level definition to something more concrete, something more operational? Um, if those 375 pages did anything, they needed to do a better job of just defining what we really mean uh, by leveling up. And the, the way we went about this is by doing it and defining it in terms of a set of missions, uh, so-called. Now, the mission-based or mission-led approach has in fact quite a long uh, and rich history uh, internationally. Uh, for some it was, um, it can be traced right back to JFK, 1962, setting a mission 
uh, of putting uh, a man, he did say a man, uh, on the moon by the end of the decade, which of course is a mission that was made good on uh, in 1969. It's been used much more recently in the context of the net zero objective uh, for climate change and indeed in the setting out uh, of the sustainable development goals by the United uh, Nations. I would have liked nothing better than if I could have encapsulated uh, leveling up in a singular mission, like putting a man on the moon or net zero. That would have been lovely. Uh, it would have been simple, it would have been singular, but it would also have been deeply inaccurate. Because when you look at, as I have over many years, it turns out, what is the secret source to success when it comes to leveling up a place? The answer is that it isn't a single ingredient. It can't be a single ingredient. But what it is, is a single recipe with multiple ingredients. So people want to say, you know, what is it all about? You know, what's the key that unlocks the door to leveling up? Is it skills? Is it infrastructure? Um, is it education? And the answer is it could be any of those things. But that's the wrong way of thinking about it, the wrong question. Think of leveling up instead as being like baking a cake, right? You have to follow a recipe with the right ingredients to bake the right cake. You ask yourself the question, which is the most important ingredient when baking a cake? The most important ingredient is the one that's missing, right? Uh, and the same is true within places. You travel around the UK, what's the single most important ingredient? It's the thing that's missing. In some places, it's transport. In other places, it's skills. In other places, uh, it's culture. In some places, the most left behind of all, it's a whole combination uh, of ingredients. And that's why when it came to defining the mission, the missions, plural, for leveling up success, we had to go plural. And we defined 12 of them 12 of those key raw ingredients without which leveling up would not work based upon the theory, based upon the evidence, both in the UK and uh, internationally. 12 of them covering economic factors, financial factors, social and leadership ones. I'll come back and say some more about those in a second. In each case, these missions, as with JFK in 1962, were serving double duty. They were answering the narrative, qualitative question, what's it all about? What lies beneath the slogan? Well, the 12 missions answer that question rather precisely. But also, and in some ways even more importantly, those missions were intended to serve as an anchor, a fixed point for ambition and policy action. A qualitatively, a qualitative horizon point towards which policy could then be fixed over the medium term. And the last of those points is really important. Fixing a point on the horizon that locks policy in over the longer term, which as I'll come on to, is essential, I think, for making a success of uh, leveling up. Here they are um, in very small print. I won't ask you to read those, but the key point here is that they are plural, plainly, 12 of them. They cover all the usual suspects, like living standards and productivity and infrastructure, digital and physical, education and skills. But crucially, they also include other stuff that wouldn't be on the standard menu of economists like me. Uh, things like well being people's sense of satisfaction in their place. Factors like the quality of their housing, uh, the amount of crime that's going on. If you stratify uh, a sample of the UK population and look at those who are least satisfied with their place, you ask those people, what's the single most important factor in your place? What could we change that would make the most difference? Then for the poorest places, with the poorest life satisfaction, the single biggest factor is crime, right? 
it's feeling safe, like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Jobs, lovely. Skills, lovely. Shops, lovely. But not being mugged by leaving the house, really, really important. And that makes perfect sense. Crime. Leadership. Having agency over your life is tremendously uh, important. Not if you're an economist like me, they're not our models. But if you're a sociologist or any of the other social sciences, absolutely crucial. That is now captured there in uh, these uh, missions. Of course, they fit together. In the same way as the eggs and the flour and the milk fit together, so too do these different dimensions, these different missions. They interact in important ways. In fact, what you find is that they interact in a way that means you can basically partition the UK into those places where those ingredients are combining positively, places that are attracting good people and good skills and good businesses and good finance, and those places that are repelling all of those factors. So we have both virtuous cycles of these things and vicious cycles of these things. And that's where we get the bifurcating pattern of areas steaming ahead and areas being left behind. It's that interaction between factors, the twin magnetic poles, some attracting, some repelling, that generates these spatial patterns of widening disparity. And the key, and the key with these missions, these 20, 30 missions, in a way, is to turn the tide within those places that are suffering from a vicious cycle and turning it instead into a virtuous one in which good people attract good business, attract good, good finance, attract good culture, attract good people. That in some ways is what the missions are seeking to do qualitatively. And what they're doing quantitatively is serving as a fixed point for policy, not just today, but right out uh, to 2030. Uh, One of the key sources of those virtuous and vicious cycles is what people do, where people move to. And this picture just shows a little map uh, of where, in this case, graduates move. And on the, uh, this is for all graduates and the graduates who move. So look at the right-hand side block. This is where, pe where people live to begin with when age 16. And the far side is where they end up uh, after they've graduated at age 27. The key takeaway is of course, as you'd all expect, the great magnetic attraction uh, of London and the other major cities and the magnetic repulsion uh, from uh, smaller cities and more rural retreats uh, of various types. If you ask me, uh, Andy, how would you really know in a sort of qualitative sense whether we've made a success of leveling up? I'd say, what would need to happen is what was captured in a, in a, in a, a slogan actually used by uh, the Teesside Mayor, Ben Houchen, uh, which, and the slogan went, um, go far, stay local. And that is exactly how success would look, where for young people growing up in every part of the UK, they feel their best chance of getting on is by sticking rather than twisting in a way that plainly is not the case uh, just at the moment a great, across great parts of uh, the UK. Putting that differently. So when it comes to figuring out um, how different the world could be, uh, were we to make good on these missions, we can begin to put some numbers. You can't, if you get put an economist in front of you, Give us, a, give us some missions, we'll give you some numbers to accompany the missions, and that's what I'm now gonna do. Um, and the key point here is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we make a mistake if we think of leveling up as a purely distributional thing, as being about taking from London to give to 
Liverpool. What this is really about is unlocking the potential in all sorts of places, both rich as well as, importantly, as well as poor. Or put differently, think of leveling up as tackling two distinct market failures. The one that's typically associated with it, which is helping left behind or poorer places, enabling them to break free of their vicious cycle and turn it into a virtuous one. That is certainly a key part of the leveling up agenda. But going back to my, my early picture of happiness, it's also about uh, reducing the stress and strain and burden felt by people in places that are doing rather well, but whose life satisfaction is currently uh, rather low. The UK's spatial imbalances, funnily enough, don't work for either rich or for poor places. And therefore, by tackling them, we can deliver a twin win. How big is that twin win? Well, this uh, table uh, put some proximate ballpark back of the envelope numbers to how much in money or money equivalent terms would be delivered if we were to make good on those missions I showed you in very, very small print a few minutes ago. I won't go through these blow by blow. Suffice to say, these are all decent chunks of change, right? Uh, in, in each case, uh, running to billions of pounds, in some cases, running to tens of billions of pounds, in a few cases, running to hundreds of billions of pounds. And this is all each year. These are benefits that would accrue and accrete over time. So if you figured out what the, if you like, the net present value of those benefits might be, you get quite quick, quickly to a number that is big. Uh, at least equivalent to a year's GDP in the UK, somewhere between perhaps two and a half and five uh, trillion pounds. That really is a decent chunk of change, right? That's well worth having. And that makes clear that the size of this prize uh, is very substantial. The economic and social case for doing this is exceptionally strong. Which begs the obvious, the obvious question, how is this to be done? How is this loaves and fishes miracle uh, to be uh, brought about? Well, um, let's start with why we haven't unlocked these benefits already. These problems aren't new. Why haven't we been able to level up in the past? And if you do your diagnosis of the past, these are among the reasons why I think we have fallen short uh, of success. The single most important reason is because we have not lacked the policies in the UK, regional policies. They have come thick and fast uh, over the past 70 years to tackle these disparities. Here's a picture of some of them. Again, I won't go through this. The key takeaways has been loads of them, right? Uh, and at best, they've lasted a decade more often have lasted much less than a decade. And that pretty much preordains failure. Because if you have regional disparities that are this deep and this entrenched, then a constant chopping of changing of policies guarantees you will not make inroads into those uh, differences over time. And that has been the story of the UK. That's the single biggest reason, I think, why our disparities are larger than those uh, elsewhere around the world. Not the only reason. Uh, we also do a pretty poor job of joining the different dots, joining different arms of policy, mixing the right ingredients in the cake mix in the right way, in the right amounts uh, at the right time. Uh, there is, crucially, um, a lack of local empowerment. The UK is one of, if not the most centralised, least devolved 
uh, of the Western advanced economies, whether in terms of spending powers or in particular in terms of taxation powers. And that too, I think, is a core ingredient in explaining why our disparities are larger. Because for me, it's absolutely essential that if you are to tackle local differences, that that is done locally using local information and the agency uh, of local people, which I'll come on to uh, in uh, a second. So um, let me get on then to what the white paper had to say about what would be done uh, differently. I mentioned earlier on um, that the white paper is quite long. Uh, in fact, I can summarize uh, those 375 pages for you uh, in a single sentence, which I'm sure you're relieved to hear. Uh, and that's it, it defined a new model of government and a new model of governance. At root, at re, at root that's what the white paper was about, a new model of government, a new model of governance. I'll spend my remaining time unwrapping what I mean uh, by both uh, of those things. The whole model is underpinned by the missions that I've shown you, and those missions are now being enshrined uh, in statute in the form of a leveling up bill, wending its way through parliament, probably quite slowly, I imagine. Uh, and that's important because no public policy is necessarily forever. But if we are to secure that longevity that I said was key to success, one way of trying to bed down, to root in longevity is to put things in statute. In primary legislation it makes it a bit harder, actually quite a lot harder for government to just scrap it and start again, if it's embedded in statute, that's important. So too, is the data and transparency that will accompany this new regime, or that is what it is uh, for leveling up. And if I was being really bold, I'd tell you, as I'm going to, that in fact, what the leveling up white paper was about was not so much a set of policies of which there have been many over the last 70 years, but what it, it instead signaled was a shift in philosophy, how policy, would be carried out as much as what policy actually was. What do I mean by that? Well, first, this new model of government, what am I talking about? My six months in the Whitehall machine, I'd observed the Whitehall machine for about 32 years at quite close quarters, had been part of that machine, but I was for six months. And my key learning from that was that the Whitehall machine has a great many similarities with my dog. Both of them completely lack spatial awareness. Uh, and by that I mean uh, most Whitehall departments behave in a place blind way. In fact, many Whitehall departments couldn't tell you exactly where they spend their money around the country. They lack even the data to know what their geographic footprint uh, looks like. That is now changing. That is now changing. Every government department will need to account for where geographically its money is being spent. And more than that, they'll be asked to account for whether that spending is supporting leveling up objectives. Truth be told, across a number of government departments, historically, the geographic distribution of their spending was worsening those spatial disparities. Right? So spending on transport, heavily skewed in London and the Southeast. Spending on R&D, heavily skewed towards the Golden Triangle, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Milton Keynes. Spending on culture, heavily skewed uh, towards London and the Southeast. Spending on housing, heavily skewed towards London and the Southeast. In future, acting in a spatially aware way means retilting that spending such that it's contributing to the shrinking of regional differences rather than amplifying those differences. That process has already begun. Whenever a new policy is now brought within government, it is put through the leveling up filter. 
what contribution is this making to leveling up? So a few months ago now, the, the school's white paper came out from the Department of Education. Before that hit the streets, that was put through a filter. What is this contributing to leveling up objectives? You read that white paper, it is full of leveling up stuff, unsurprisingly, uh, on the back of that. There's more I could say about that. On the last, last agenda item, this will sound really processy and bureaucratic. Uh, and if the answer to the world's problems was a cabinet committee, uh, it'd be much simpler to solve the world's problems. It isn't, of course, but there is now a cabinet committee set up since the start of the year. It meets weekly, involves all departments. It's a way of rewiring Whitehall to put leveling up considerations front and center for that joined up conversation about policy when it comes to leveling up uh, considerations. The more interesting though, and radical part of this new model is not the new model of government, but the new model of governance. That is to say, what happens outside of Whitehall? Local government, local business, local leaders in their many and various shapes and forms. Because for me, we have not a hope of making good on leveling up unless the majority of the action takes place not in a command and control way from the Whitehall departments, but instead happens locally as it should, using local people with local information and local agency to craft local plans to drive local growth. Lots of locals in there, but that's the key in a way. One element of that is local government, is what is sometimes called devolution. And as part of the white paper, we set out a, a range of things that would be done to move much further along the devolution track to decentralize a great many more uh, areas and powers than has been the case in the past. You can read this stuff for yourself. Greater Manchester has a prominent role as a so-called trailblazer when it comes to Devo, something I was discussing with Andy Burnham just this morning, is what form might that Devo deal take so that Greater Manchester was indeed uh, blazing uh, that trail alongside uh, the West Midlands. The objective here, sometimes overlooked, encapsulated in that mission, is that by 2030, not only has every part of England that wants one got a Devo deal, but, and here's the kicker, that they will have powers at or approaching London levels. Now, if that happened, and it might not, but if it did happen by 2030, that would be the biggest decentralization and shift in local governance in the UK for at least a century, I would say, which is big news. Um, but not just deeper and wider, but also simpler. So one of my first, uh, on my first week actually, I remember being in, in Whitehall, I asked someone to go away and add up, count the number of local government funding pots that existed. They um, gave up 139, so there's at least 139 different funding pots. That's obviously a complete joke, right? It doesn't work for Whitehall, doesn't work certainly for local areas. That needs simplifying. We need something much simpler and longer term, if we are to make good on a new model of local government. But it's not just about the public sector, because the private sector and universities have an equally important part to play when it comes to leveling up. In fact, I'd go further than that. I'd say without a thriving private sector and HE and FE se sector, leveling up will forever be pushing water uphill, which is difficult work. This is an essential prerequisite of making a success of leveling up, enabling and empowering the private sector, using public monies, if you like, to crowd in private finance of various types. The good news here is that actually, if you look across the UK, these are designated clusters of business activity. There are lots of them. 
there may be as many as 30 or 40 actual or embryonic clusters of business activity, which is uh, great news. You can see some of them here for yourself. The key for me will be to convert those pre-existing or embryonic clusters into super clusters, bridging a larger range of industries and sectors and regions, the like of which we see elsewhere across the world, particularly uh, in North America. There are great things underway. And one of the roles that government can play is not to get in the way of these, but to enable them either through small amounts of seed corn financing or through removing barriers and, and restrictions or by coordinating the actions of different partners at a local level. And the final element of this, if you like, the final um, point on the triangle would be communities, the hyper local level. Devo is not enough. What we actually need is double Devo, the designation and decentralization of power to the hyper-local level to tackle those hyper-local problems I mentioned earlier on at the level of communities rather than large city regions uh, of various types. And in the lovely white paper, not much focused on actually. We set out some ideas for how this might be brought about. I've listed them uh, here. There is more work to be done to turn these words into some uh, actions. I'm going to uh, stop here with some of the unanswered uh, questions, perhaps teeing up Luke's discussion and beyond. Um, what are the critiques of this? Well, some have said the missions we've set out, actually half of the people have said the missions we set out are impossible. The other half have said they're unambitious. So I'm reassured by that. Uh, uh, in the same way as I'm reassured by being run over in both directions. Um, someone said the cost of living crisis will put paid to leveling up. I don't think so. I think the opposite is actually true because that, that cost of living crisis will hit hardest the poorest people in poorest places and make it even more of an economic, social, and political uh, imperative. Can we rewire white all? I certainly hope so. Has Devo got much further to go? It has, we might discuss that in the discussion. A lot of talk at the moment of the need for a new growth plan. We don't need a new growth plan. Let it happen locally. We've got a, we've got a growth plan for the country. It's called leveling up. And finally, um, this is about local places. This is about local People. This is about, if we can use the expression, taking back control. It's about agency. Uh, and that might be the biggest prize at all, of all from all of this. I even recklessly gave this set of things uh, a, a name a few uh, months ago, a new flavor uh, of capitalism, capitalism rooted in localism, community uh, capitalism. Does the white paper signal uh, a new flavor? Uh, a new dawn for capitalism being ushered in. I certainly hope so. But with that, let me stop and take your thoughts, reflections, questions, and those of Luke on all of that. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you, Andy, for that wonderful ex exposition. Uh, we had uh, why, what, how, and I think quite a lot of who at the end as well, uh, and uh, set out very many challenges for, for us to think about. I mean, largely, I'm going to take this uh, into a discussion with our aud audience here and, and our remote one, but I, I do have a few questions as well. And uh, mainly, I think they go back to the uh, the, the how and who. Uh, if we look at the reception of the levelling up white paper, uh, I, I think there was a almost universal agreement that it was a, 
uh, a brilliant diagnosis uh, and what debate there has been about it has been how to take that diagnosis uh, and turn it into programmatic activity. Now, I, I believe uh, in a previous lecture, I found a quote from you which said that it was the, the opposite of a bad budget, uh, uh, effectively a, a slow burner, something that would have more effect uh, as time went on rather than in, in immediate um, response. So I mean, in a minute, I'm gonna come back to the missions, but first of all, I, I, I would like to ask, ask you the, the, the general question, do you think we have a sufficient political infrastructure to take it forward? Um, thank you, Luke. Um, so um, funnily enough, um, I do. I, I, I tell you why I do as well. Um, and uh, I, I'm conscious that lovely, whatever you end up calling it, um, will only be successful, only be successful if it has cross party support and indeed cross generational support. Given that, you know, for me, it's a pursuit that will take probably multiple decades, not to make progress, but certainly to turn all of those tides that I mentioned. Uh, earlier on. The reason I'm optimistic about it, both politically and generationally, is because what we have at the moment, um, whether by accident or design, is an alignment of the stars uh, economically, socially, and politically. So we have in this something that is economically uh, efficient. It grows the pie of a significant scale. I've given you some sense of the scale that we're talking about well worth having so it's the economically efficient thing to do it is the socially just thing to do because those are there's a large and rising and unjustifiable differences in opportunity for people you know uh if someone's destiny is defined by their geography something is serious, seriously going wrong and that is intolerable and that which is intolerable tends not to be tolerated and shouldn't be. But the third dimension is that it just turns out that that's also politically expedient uh, for reasons of red wall and all the rest of it. So we have a set of policies, a, an objective that works economically, works socially and works politically. Hands up who's against that. Uh, I'm not sure that I see too many hands going up um, across different parties, across different generations. So that gives me hope that whatever it's called, whichever individual uh, of whatever party, whatever time, will be enough in here if they want to stick to the knitting and, and, and see it through. Maybe not in this precise form, who knows? But the overall shape needs to be, overall direction needs to be this one, I think. Well, we, we have some political shorthands. You just mentioned one of them, red wall, and to go with that uh, blue wall, which are, uh, uh, are probably not very good, but they do seem to influence how, how politicians behave nonetheless. But that seemed to be at odds with, uh, uh, I thought your most striking slide was the one that showed intra-regional disparity. Um, that doesn't work in red wall and blue wall, is it? So. No, the, the two things don't map. And in that sense, you know, I don't know that uh, the the purpose and orientation of leveling up is, is always as well communicated as it might be because i think it often is billed as being a north versus south or city versus uh town thing and that just doesn't map the uk's map um uh it does call for a, a more surgical a more precise approach to tackling the problems that we've uh, mentioned that's as true in manchester as any other city across the uk um, so there isn't a one for one between the economics and the politics, but there's a strong enough correlation to want to do the right thing, I think. Uh, absolutely. Let, let me m move on to a different aspect, the, the missions, because this does seem to be the, the sharp edge of, of what is in, in the paper. Um, talk about missions always begins, as did you, top of the list with the uh, Apollo moonshot moon and what's particularly distinctive about the moonshot is that you know when you've landed on the moon yeah uh, 
uh, it's quite difficult to find social missions where you have that same certainty that, yeah. that you're there. Now, I, I know the paper, and uh, you had it in your slides as well, has uh, made a big effort to put metrics on, on everything. Uh, I did notice that almost all of those metrics were absolute rather than relative. Mm. So they weren't about leveling up. They were saying, this is the level we want to uh, um, uh, achieve. Was, was that deliberate? Okay. No, I think, I mean, they are a bit of a mix, I think. Um, so there's the headline missions, uh, many of which are cast in, in, in relative terms, the, the differences between best and worst were, were closing rather than widening um, uh, over time. That's at the high level mission. Um, where there's further work to do, when you're right about this, Luke, is what are the, you know, the, the long list probably of metrics below, below each mission that will serve as the arbiter of uh, success over time. And that's, I think, as we were candid enough to set out, that, that, is, that is work in progress. F further work is needed on that. Um, we've set up, uh, as part of the white paper process, uh, an advisory council uh, of experts on various uh, things, which are actually I'm going to uh, chair. And part of its purpose will be to develop that set of metrics so that government's feet will be held to the flame uh, over time. And when we are off the critical path, if you like, for each of the missions, that can be signposted, signaled, and hopefully course corrected uh, in real time. That's the hope. Uh, I'd just like to ask one, one more thing before I go to the audience. It's, it's, it's more your personal voyage to this. Um, uh, I think when we last met, uh, you were chairing the Industrial Strategy Council, and you've, now you've produced the Leveling Up white paper, and uh, indeed, uh, steering the, the, the RSA. So uh, you've had at least two shots at the problem. What, what, were the what were the commonalities and the differences between those perspectives? I mean, in some respects, um, there are similarities. Um, a bit strange if there weren't, I'd say, because um, the, the, the part and parcel of similar sorts of uh, issues uh, I mean, what are the unifying factors between the two? Uh, well, one is the importance of the local. Uh, if you are to generate jobs, uh, incomes, uh, industry, uh, prosperity, uh, productivity, uh, you need a plan, and those plans uh, should really be local if they have any chance of success. So, um, uh, and I suppose the second common theme would be that um, letting the market do this on its own is a mistake, is a mistake. Um, it's a mistake from which we should have learned our lessons uh, during the 1970s and 1980s. When old industries die, as industries do periodically, it is not enough to hope that others will instantly be reborn uh, in the ground that's been vacated. In other words, you need an active strategy, an industrial strategy, a leveling up strategy that refertilizes the ecosystem and reseeds the ground if new industry is to flourish. And that uh, refertilization and rebirth and reseeding needs to happen through the combined forces acting in partnership. Uh, of the public sector, centrally and locally, the private sector uh, and civil society, including universities and colleges and uh, NHS trusts uh, and the like. That has been the model of success since the Industrial Revolution, the coming together of public, private and civic in partnership to deliver local growth. It's a uh, it's a recipe that was lost sight of for a number of decades in this country and elsewhere, and which we sought to rediscover through the work industrial strategy and laterally through the leveling at white paper. Well, we, we would like to think that's, that that's how we see the world and behave in Manchester, but there yes. we are sitting below your blue line, so obviously not doing it well enough. 
Uh, I, I'm going to take three or so questions from the audience and then uh, three from our uh, online uh, participants. Uh, lady here at the, the front first, please. Um, just on the previous bit on sign building, it mentioned uh, in the parish council, I'm not sure if Christ might come back. Does this mean that we could only deal with the whole or, or boundaries actually mean the old commission council? Is it movement or is it um, complex? Take, take a few and then. Yes, let, let, yeah. let, let's just collect. Uh, Maybe just take it straight behind first, and then we'll move uh, up. Um, Hello. Um, thank you for that extremely broad blue sky. Um, I wonder, I've been critical of the Learning Not White Compact, and um, partly I think some of these issues are too much and some too little. But the one I want to talk about is mission number one, right? So the job, pay, and productivity converging by 2030. <coughs> not a chance. Not a chance. Um, sorry. In that mission one, particularly since the north was not very sunny, but in that mission one, and I'm trying to explain it to people that don't care about policy, and they just said, it just keeps talking about area, and it uses it in that one sentence in three distinct ways. The first means area means everywhere. The second is area sort of means a city within each, so it could be a sort of mega region, sub-national, could be national, could be a modern region. Or a super cluster. And the third one is about convergence. So you would need something over that you could converge over, so that's the region. And I was like, well, you know, air, well, yeah, I can't, uh, I, and that's why it feels really well to say, because in 20 words, you do three distinctly different senses. And again, there are those of us that come from a different tradition, which is called spatial planning and economic development. And there is area for area based policy, and you can intervene, you know, internationally, nationally, nations of the UK, regions, so you know, there's, there's the whole list of the ways that you can intervene. And this is important, but it can't do it on its own, and it feels very frittered and hyper local when actually there are strategic tiers, and the sub national, arguably. Is viewed in this bit as the most important for city region or the sub national, but a specific set of institutional circumstances here, and so people know much better than me. But the unwillingness to nest the scales together dooms this to irrelevance. And by the way, I think if it was a choice, I'd rather have the industrial strategy than this one. Can you have that one other one, please? Because that is. <laughs> More Thank you. We'll take one more from the room. Uh, gentleman in the middle up there with a burgundy uh, jacket. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I liked your optimism, but I'd like to take you back to Samuel Johnson because this problem has been with us for a very long time. And I don't think you've said very much about why. And I was looking at your map of Kensington. I know people in Kensington. Don't they want cheap housing around the corner for the servants to live in? You haven't talked much about politics. And you seem to think that this wonderful government is going to do these wonderful things. And some of us are a bit cynical about that. What's going to stop it? We've um, saved up a good range of questions there. So yeah. excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. How long have we got? Uh, the uh, uh, trivia, let me take those in turn then. Uh, thank you. Um, so on the uh, the Paris Council, I mean, uh, sorry, I don't have a chance to go into that in any great depth. Um, what we spoke about, it was in brief actually, uh, in the paper was making it somewhat easier for new parish councils to be set up if, if areas thought that was a good way to go. Because right now, um, and I'm not the expert remotely, uh, it's apparently quite a painful and convoluted and bureaucratic process and making it somewhat easier to, to create new ones. Uh, but that was really part of a broader uh, strategy for places and spaces, I think it was called. Uh, that wasn't my name, by the way. I'd have chosen something a bit punchier than that. Um, 
which is uh, very much work in progress. But the basic idea is, could we find means uh, of empowering and enabling not just the mayors, uh, but those at a much more local level, uh, either with either by transferring assets, and that's already begun, to the community ownership fund, uh, or through powers of, of, of various types. And the parish council idea was in the spirit of that, the empowering of uh, places. To the question um, um, about uh, scales of, of, uh, of, of intervention, and our use of uh, the word area in three different ways in, in, in one mission, which I think is pretty good going, um, uh, by drafting uh, standards. I hope on some of the specifics of your um, question about the mission, we've tried to unwrap and, un, um, and pick this a bit in the, the technical annex, um, Little Red, the technical annex, uh, to the white paper, a mere 50 pages, a real purge turn of the weekend for anyone, um, about um, how we're thinking about uh, this, the different ways in which we keep score on uh, convergence. I think what you say about uh, the different scales of intervention and how they nest together. I think there's, 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 some, there's some truth that wasn't done uh, with particular pr precision, particularly at the sub-regional level, and that's true. Um, there is, there remains something a bit of a tension here between two things. One is uh, having a large enough area to fully harness and harvest the benefits of those economies of scale and scope and agglomeration on the one hand, and on the other, operating at the scale or level where people kind of know each other and are bound together, uh, which can often be very community-based and much smaller. So that the benefits of the first kick in certainly north of a million, probably well north of a million. Uh, the benefits of the second peter out probably at several thousand. And there is something of a tension there that I haven't even fully reconciled in my mind, but perhaps you can help me do it uh, after the talk. Um, on the, um, I have the very, very good fortune to the third question of not being a politician and never having been one and never will be one. Uh, and my, you know, my life both in first many, many years at the Bank of England uh, was, you know, I was legislatively uh, separate from politics. And even my time in civil service, I was constitutionally separate from politics. I've been very uh, happy to have that uh, separation and, and, of course, still have that separation in the new gig too. So I couldn't pretend to be enough of an uh, expert um, uh, on, the, on the politics of this. Yeah, beyond saying that, you know, my reason for getting involved in this was born out of a passion of uh, at least 40 years uh, is the product of a Sunderland council estate. I know what leveling up is all about and have done sort of throughout my life. And that's why it's of real importance to me at a personal level. Um, and part of the hope I had from helping produce the white paper as a civil servant was to use that as the catalyst and the point where we kicked off a genuine debate among the main political parties uh, about how we do better on this front. I do mean kick off. Now, I don't like nothing better than for the main parties uh, to be competing for virtue when it comes to how best we go about tackling this problem. In other words, playing leapfrog in the scale and seriousness and pace at which it was gone about. That so far has not happened, right? I'm waiting for this competition for virtue to kick off, but I hope it does because the stakes politically, economically, and socially uh, could not uh, be higher. I hope the people in this room are also part of that process of competition for virtue when it comes to putting forward ideas for how we do better, using this perhaps as a, uh, as a, as a baseline. Thank you, Andy. Now, Jim here is the voice of our uh, uh, on online participants. So uh, could you give us a couple of questions from them, please? Um, so we've had some uh, excellent questions um, coming from our online audience. Uh, I'll just 
take uh, three if that's okay. Firstly, is there a country that has successfully leveled up? And if so, what lessons can we learn from their approach? Secondly, the commitment to net zero does not seem to appear in the 12 missions. Is there a reason for this or is it tackled elsewhere? And thirdly, how best can we ensure equality within leveling up, i.e. to ensure that within local areas we tackle gender and ethnic disparities as the area is leveled up as a whole? Yeah. Three more great questions. Um, let me have a go at those. I'll try to do it quickly if we've got a chance to go back uh, to the audience. Um, uh, various times in the past, uh, I've spent some time looking at international evidence uh, on countries that have made a success of leveling up or areas, often subregions that have made a success of leveling up. There, there, is, there are many examples, uh, exactly, uh, as it turns out. Uh, there are many more examples of places failing, uh, trying but failing uh, to do it. There are lessons from both to be had, and I hope we've uh, garnered um, the right lessons from that international uh, experience. Um, some of the general ones I, I touched upon earlier on. Uh, so I think it is difficult, if not impossible, uh, to level up without uh, a significant and deep degree of decentralization and devolution of powers. Uh, I think it's near impossible to do it uh, without uh, coordinating the arms of policy, transport, skills, jobs, education, uh, and the like. I think it is impossible to do it without in some way, shape or form, uh, having a, a long-term commitment to which you stick. I certainly think it's close to impossible unless you have some strong civic institutions at the subnational level uh, that can make this happen. Uh, on all those fronts, the UK fares poorly. Uh, and just on the final of those, um, one of the things I didn't discuss today, but could have discussed a lot more, was the role of those civic institutions. I mean, Manchester, Greater Manchester is blessed in having a set of such civic institutions built up now over 20 or 30 years, including, I should say, this one at the university uh, under Nancy and Fiona's uh, leadership. Look, uh, many parts of the UK do not have that endowment. Their civic institutions have been run down over the last 50 to 70 years. Uh, they lack the capacity and capability uh, to make good on this new model of governance. And that will take time uh, to rebuild. And that's a key lesson uh, of both history and indeed of international experience. On net zero, I mean, to a degree, I feel, feel a degree of kind of mea culpa on this. We, we wrestle with whether we should include it as a separate mission. The truth is, there was already uh, a lot out there around a, a net zero strategy for the UK. Um, the mea culpa is not that we didn't include it as a mission, but that we didn't make more of, again, the divine alignment between leveling up objectives and net zero objectives. Because the truth is, if you look at the correlation between the, the largest carbon emitting places in the UK and those most in need of leveling up, there's a very strongly positive correlation. And that's a huge opportunity. That is to say, by investing in new clean green tech, we can both hit our net zero objectives faster and hit our leveling up objectives faster than might otherwise be the case. So case in point, uh, the part of the world where I was born, the Northeast, parts of it not especially well off, uh, but there's huge potential there, I think, for a clean green super cluster, to use that word again, running from the borders right down to the wash and uh, embracing you know, Nis Nissan Envision electric vehicles in Sunderland, uh, Britvolt at Blythe, all the great offshore wind stuff in and around the uh, Humber. Uh, that would be an example of net zero and leveling up working very much in partnership. I think the potential there is very, uh, is the very, uh, is, is a very considerable one. I managed to forget, or indeed, I can't read my own writing on the third question, which I can only apologize. Please, sorry. 
is of how can we ensure equality within the ah, that's by right. ensuring within local areas of national agenda and ethnic concerns are being dealt with as a whole. Yeah, um, so I'd written down DEI, but then couldn't read the ERI. Um, uh, this is a, a really crucial uh, bit. Uh, I mean, the truth is, going back to correlations again, um, you know, the, the poorest parts of the UK uh, tend also uh, to be those, um, uh, or can often be those, uh, with larger numbers of ethnic minorities. So there's a, again, in meeting leveling up objectives, we can help hit some of our D, E, and I objectives uh, too. I think it's really important uh, at the local level uh, that those local plans do embed in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations uh, when thinking about unlocking the potential in place. And let me give you a very concrete example, actually, partly brought out of experience earlier on today, uh, when I was across in, um, uh, in Salford at uh, Skill City. Um, if you look at patterns of entrepreneurship, of startups, okay, um, they are disproportionately skewed, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, to being led by uh, white, uh, rich males. Uh, there is what's sometimes called a, a lost Einstein problem, what I prefer to call a, a lost Marie Curie problem, uh, which is to say uh, too few entrepreneurs and inventors uh, from poorer backgrounds um, who are female uh, and who are from ethnic minorities. I think one of the things that local areas can do, and national areas as well, is look to discover more of those lost uh, curies uh, and to spawn a new generation of entrepreneurs amongst those who are otherwise uh, risk of being excluded. Uh, as it turns out, we have a, a real potential endowment here because among Gen Zs and millennials, we think it looks to be the case attitudinally they are much more likely uh, to set up a business and want to become an entrepreneur. So the potential embedded, but currently unlocked among the excluded entrepreneurs, among the lost queries is, is, is considerable. I'd love local areas to do more as is happening just across the way to help incubate and seed cord finance uh, entrepreneurs otherwise at risk of being lost. I think you'd find among our student entrepreneurs exactly that profile. So maybe there's a generation shift go, go, going on. Uh, just time for a couple more from within the room. Uh, from the side there with the uh, map. Hi, it's been a great presentation and uh, thank you very much. As a new member of the RSA, I just want to uh, say it's great to have you uh, in that position. Thank you. Um, really great presentation. I was somewhat disappointed, I have, to, I have to say, by the penultimate slide that while we've mentioned private sector and public and civic institutions have been highlighted for this and you've referenced on the community side, things like parish councils and community funds, what one might call faith communities was noticeable by the absence on that slide. And, um, and to be honest with you, what you've said so far, though in my view, the voluntary and often innovative contributions of such, and I could point to you as to several fantastic local examples here in this city can't be taken as read indeed in many places poverty and inequality would have been far far worse both in history and right now were it not for the contribution of such so i just wonder if you have any thoughts or comments on the the role of such in, uh, such things in in the, the city and beyond should take a few yeah yeah um uh, up on the same side yep. Uh, hi, um, just a question about the importance of civic engagement and empowerment. Hi, hi, sorry, <laughs> do we were. Um, you know, if you're saying it's really important, civic engagement, empowerment is really key to levelling up. What more can we do in the university? What greater role can we play in making a difference? Mm. Uh, 
and one more just straight across the aisle there. Kindly, I'd like to push you a little bit on your competition for virtue point. So is there any way we can get a competition for virtue around devolution and decentralization? I have in mind that we've, we've forgotten our virtues in this respect. So we did have a period in this country when we, when we did narrow the gaps between places and people. It was the 30 years after the Second World War. And we had missions. We had a mission for full employment. We had a mission to create a national health service. And we had a mission to create a welfare state to support people through the hardest of times. We also, um, looking, at, looking internationally, can look to Germany, uh, particularly what's happened since the, uh, the fall of the war. But one of the major reasons why East Germany has, has managed to turn itself around is because it has a constitution which automatically redistributes massive resources from rich to poorer lender or regions, as we would know them. Um, the, the reason there's some forgotten virtue in here is that that constitution was written by British constitutional theorists. Mm. Have we forgotten um, what's good about the things we've done in terms of levelling up? And can we get a competition for virtue going again? Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, Three more uh, great uh, questions. Do you want me to, to be brief, Luke? I don't know. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, yes. Fiona, Fiona's nodding. So, yes. so, so, I don't miss my train. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let me answer briefly then. Um, on the first, I think this is my second mayor call for them. Um, I didn't mention it, but here, I think I absolutely should have done. They're, they're certainly um, uh, mentioned, maybe not as much as they could be and should be, uh, the role of um, faith communities of various types in. in, in, in um, providing that third pillar, that crucial civil society pillar. I think you are absolutely uh, right. A lot of the best examples uh, I have seen of community building uh, have been led by faith communities of various types. And in my previous uh, life at the Bank of England, when I was traveling around the UK, which I spent quite a chunk of my time, as Brian knows, uh, doing, uh, I would therefore make a point uh, of spending often days at a time with faith-based communities across the nomination uh, to understand the fantastic work they were doing. So um, I'm completely with you on that. Um, I would say that third pillar um, is a less developed pillar in the white paper and would benefit from further definition. Maybe it's work RSA can do. There's a thought. Um, on Universities, absolutely, there you are, lost you again. Um, absolutely crucial uh, in, the, in the convening and coalescing world. I mean, I know that, that, that Nancy and Fiona uh, and others here play that role, are playing that much more expansive role in placemaking. And I see that all, all across the UK. Uh, I have to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a great, great believer, as you'd imagine, from someone who spent 30, 32 years in one institution and has now moved to another one. Um, I'm a great believer in institutions uh, as objective, completely neutral, uh, long-term foundations of, of good things and universities are right up there uh, in achieving that. And a lot of the great things I see on leveling up, not just in Manchester, but beyond, are led by, the, by, by, by universities. They can be a leader every bit as much as a mayor and in many places are. I think that's really, really important. Um, acting across sector uh, for, the, for a public purpose. And finally, on, on Alan's question, which is a, um, obviously a massive one and, and a deep one, and one I can't do justice to, but suffice to say, um, the framework for devolution that we tried to set out uh, as best we could, because um, there are competing views, um, uh, across the political classes uh, about the, the cause of Devo. The front, the front we, we tried to set out uh, was intended to try and generate something of a competition, actually, between different areas, experimenting with stuff. The reason we called the GM and the WM, the Greater Manchester and the West Midlands deals, trailblazer deals, is because we wanted those places to push the envelope. And we then wanted other places to say, I want some of what they've got. 
Now it's too early to say whether that will be successful because the deals are still being done for the trailblazers. But my hope would be they will surprise on the upside. And that off the back of that, there'll be a lot of other places saying, well, if they've got that, why not us? And if so, I think we'll be moving in the direction that you mentioned. Uh, perhaps if not quite at the pace, but at least in the right direction. Um, I'm not equipped to discuss the case for and against the constitution as a way of um, embedding all of this. Um, but if we're thinking big and thinking bold, why not think that? Thank you so much, Andy. I'll hand straight to Fiona. Thank you. So I'm going to now wrap up very quickly, and we just have to shoot off uh, Captain Crane. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity, Andy, to thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Um, I was going to add a, lot, a variety of comments, but I'll save them for the opportunity that we all have, uh, the rest of us, to go to the mill and for drinking canopies and continue the conversation, which is important in itself. And I do hope that you'll all stay with me and, and do that. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Luke, uh, for facilitating the discussion, but especially thank you to you and the online audience uh, for some fantastic questions, lots of food for thought. And we, of course, look forward to inviting Andy back again in the near future. So thank you very much for your talk.